today, obviously, going to be talking about di those diagnostics that we can do in the shelter. And I decided to, to stick to ones that are fairly um, easy, easier and hands-on, um, so not going into um, ones like that you use analyzers for, like say, you know, an in-house analyzer that you're doing CBC and chem panels and that kind of thing. Um, but before we get into talking about, um, you know, reviewing techniques and, and looking at ways to avoid common mistakes, I wanted to talk just a little bit about um, the impact of our decisions around using some of those diagnostics and, and what that can mean. Um, and, you know, when I say what that impact is, you know, essentially I'm talking about when we decide to do diagnostics, we do need to take some things, you know, into account. Obviously, there's the, the cost of doing the, the diagnostic itself, and can we do that? But then also kind of the cost, if you will, of that decision to do the diagnostic, and also making sure that we have individuals that know how to appropriately complete those diagnostics. So, so when thinking about that, you know, what we really need to think about is what happens if, if we make uh, the wrong decision, if you will. So if we either choose the incorrect test um, or we don't do the technique correctly. And, you know, for looking at that, I think we can, either, a simple example would be just doing the wrong test. And I'm sure this is something that's probably happened to everyone in this room um, or, or in the shelter that you're in. But it's just, you know, accidentally picking the wrong test. So, you know, say it's, it's a busy day, you're out there, you're, you go out and you draw some samples of, of blood, you're planning on doing, you know, several heartworm tests on dogs. So you go out, you draw samples, you know, say you get samples from, from 10 dogs, you come back, and you're in a hurry trying to get 10 things done at once um, because all shelters are so well staffed and we have, we have plenty of people to get those things done. So, um, so you come back and in your rush, instead of grabbing the canine heartworm test, you grab, grab a feline combo test and you start running the test and you realize halfway through, after you put the sample on, that you picked the wrong test. Obviously it's not the end of the world, but now you've got to take the time to go back and get the correct test and start running that test. Um, hopefully you got enough sample to begin with so you don't have to go redraw blood from those um, you know, nice little chihuahuas that everybody has. Um, but uh, so, so that's time, and then it's also obviously money because you've just now, you know, wasted those feline combo tests, and um, are going to have to replace those if you need to use them in the future. Um, so, you know, it may not seem like a big deal, but obviously, I think you guys understand that money you know, that starts starts to add up. You know, you think, okay, it's one test, maybe that's what somewhere thirteen, fifteen dollars, something like that. But you know, if you're doing ten of those, that quickly adds up, and we all know budgets can be uh, very tight, so we try to obviously limit those mistakes. And again, it's your time as well. But sometimes those, those choices um, or, or uh, that choice to, to either, if you do the wrong test or if you have somebody that maybe thinks they know how to run the test but really isn't running it correctly, that can lead to some, to some bigger issues. So say, for example, you have somebody that's, that's running fecals on um, a dog or dogs that have had diarrhea, you know, and you're trying to figure out what's going on. And you have this person, again, I'm sure we've all been in situations, somebody comes on board, they said, yeah, I was trained as a technician at such and such a clinic or such and such a shelter. You're like, great, they know how to do a fecal, we're all good. And, you know, they go do the fecals, don't find anything. Okay, not, not necessarily uncommon. We take it, yep, that's, that's fine, okay, so we're just going to treat symptomatically. Well, the dog's, you know, not getting better with our symptom, the basic kind of symptomatic treatment for diarrhea. So, you know, a couple days later, decide, okay, let's, let's try this again. Well, now, just because of staffing or as luck would have it, somebody else runs the test. Well, lo and behold, they, they diagnose um, Giardia in, in half the cases um, or, or something else. You know, that it could be that it's just that that's when that animal was shedding and they happened to pick it up that day. But if it's because that person didn't truly know how to perform the test correctly, um, what happens? That dog was not properly diagnosed, so you couldn't start the correct treatment in time. So obviously that leads to increased length of stay. And for those of you that were just in um, Dr. Dittar's lecture last session, you know what happens when we get animals that are in the shelter for um, increased length of time. 
Um, you know, it's going to just cost, again, alone. We have to care for that animal. We have to pay somebody to care for that, for that animal while they're there. Um, and that can impact their well, that animal's welfare as well because they're in the shelter longer. We're not diagnosing the correct disease, correct condition, so that animal is suffering. Um, you know, it's you know, maybe not the same as level of suffering that you see with you know, an animal has a fractured leg or something, but I'm sure the animal's not comfortable if they have diarrhea for you know, four or five days in a row. Um, so that can lead to prolonged illness. So, so as you guys can see, all of these things kind of go hand in hand. It can kind of you know, blow up pretty quickly. So that's why we really need to, to pay attention to the decisions we're making um, and then also just think about that too when we are doing training with staff because I'm sure as technicians, most of you, if not all of you, are the ones do running those diagnostic tests and probably training new team members as they come on. So I think it's important that even if you feel confident in your skills that, uh, you know, it's always good to review with the team to make sure everyone is following the same protocol and that when you're teaching new staff members that you're all teaching them the same way so everyone is doing, is doing the same thing. So just, again, just some things to, to kind of think about and keep in the back of your mind when we're talking about doing tests. So the diagnostics that we're going to uh, talk about today, um, you can see here, and we're going to go through each of these, some a little bit more in depth than others. And while some may seem very basic, like microchip scanning, I think they're things that are really important in, in the work we do, and we need to make sure, again, that everybody is doing them correctly and um, following you know, the same procedures so that we're not, uh, we're not missing things and leading to that increased length of stay in those animals. So microchip scanning. Um, I'm sure if I asked, everyone would say, yes, I know how to, I know how to scan for microchip. But um, I think, again, we need to think about make sure you're doing it correctly. Because how many of you have, have been in the situation where um, hopefully, you know, in, in your shelter protocols, animals are getting scanned multiple times? Because we know that, you know, no diagnostic is perfect 100% of the time. So it's possible that microchips are going to get missed. So that's why you know, we scan at intake. We, we scan before we implant a new microchip. We scan before they go to surgery, that kind of thing. Um, but how many of you have been in the situation where um, you go to scan a dog or a cat, whatever it is, and you can already see on their record, yep, there's, there's no chip listed in the record. Nobody's found it. You know it's been scanned at least once already in your shelter's process and you barely even get near the animal with that microchip scanner and it goes off and finds a chip. Anybody been in that situation before? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, you're, you know, and your immediate thought is, how did they miss this? And, and again, you know, we know nothing is perfect, but we also know there are ways that we can you know, improve our, um, the, essentially the efficacy of, those, of that scanning that we're doing. So a couple of things to, to keep in mind. First of all, Hopefully you guys all have universal scanners. If you don't, you definitely need um, to get one. Um, and there, because there are three different frequencies of microchips, so you need to make sure that you're able to um, pick up um, any of those potential microchips that might be implanted. Um, and ideally, what you can do is, again, if you have, if animals are scanned at multiple points along the animal's stay in the shelter, have a different brand of scanner, um, so maybe one at intake and one that you have back in the clinic area, um, to, again, to increase the chances of finding the chip. Um, and also, too, this sounds really simple, but make sure that the scanner has really well-charged batteries because um, that can make a huge difference. If you have um, batteries that are just about ready to die, you're not going to be able to, to pick up the microchips as easily. Um, and, and also, too, just make sure that your scanner is working appropriately. So test that scanner daily. Um, and this is, this is pretty easy. They, um, and a lot of the microchip companies even, um, now they make real cute little, you know, like a little stuffed animal or something that has a microchip in it that you can test it. We used to have just, it was like a little keychain. You could actually see the chip inside there. But just have that wherever you have microchip scanners and have, you know, add that on to someone's opening duties for the day for that area that they just, you know, take the scanner, scan real quick, make sure that it's actually working. Um, and then also, too, when you're scanning, and we'll go over in just a second the 
procedure to use to make sure that you're they're scanning the whole animal. Um, if you find a chip, don't necessarily stop right away because it is definitely possible that animals have more than one chip. And again, I'm sure a lot of you have, have come across that where um, you find more than one chip in an animal. And if, if both of them are there, obviously we need to make sure both those numbers are, are in the animal's record. Um, so technique. Um, again, I know, you know a lot of you are probably sitting there thinking, yeah, yeah, I know how to do this. But just think about, you know, is, is this what you're doing when you're scanning? Because again, I know we all get busy and we want to get things done really quickly. But when you're scanning, you want to make sure that you're holding that scanner uh, parallel to the animal and kind of gently rock it side to side um, as you're scanning. And, and in the next slide, I'll show you kind of the, um, kind of the S pattern, if you will, that we want to use. Um, and it should really be, you know, ideally kind of just right in contact or maybe less than an inch from the animal so that you can, so you can pick up that chip if it's there. And go slowly. This is probably the biggest mistake I see. I know I would see it all the time in the shelter when I was working there that, again, you know, people are they're trying to get done fast and, it, you know, they take like two seconds and they've scanned the animal. Um, and that's, that's likely how most chips are, are getting missed. And also, too, just using that consistent pattern. So just like with anything else that you do, if you do it the same way every time, you're less likely to miss things. So this is kind of the, the diagram that you want to follow. So obviously, start on the animal's back. You know, start up all the way at the back of the head, kind of do that S along the back. And then go down along the sides of the animal as well. Um, I've, I've seen, I know my own cat that we used to have, I could, I could feel her microchip way down on her, on her shoulder. So obviously that had, you know, had migrated quite a bit. And I'm sure you guys have found chips and um, not the typical spot between the shoulder blades. Um, so that's why it's really important to make sure that we're, that we're scanning um, the whole animal. So a couple videos here that I want you guys to watch. And um, you know, let, let me know what you think. So, so first one, what do you think about this technique? We're done. Good. How many of you have seen that? Seen that in your shelters? Yeah. Uh, and we got this one. So, <laughs> what do you think? I mean, you know, we're not we're not covering the whole animal. Um, really, you know, just going over the back and pretty quick as well. The very good. I know the dog is very cooperative, and <laughs> I think somebody's bribing him. <laughs> ah, yeah, he's getting a little massage. I think I think he likes it. <laughs> but so as you can see, you know, this is what you know we want to do. We're we're um, going over the whole animal, and you know, like they're doing right there, kind of going along the chest. We've definitely I know the the last shelter I was in, we would find them there. Um, not infrequently, you know, kind of, uh, particularly it seemed like in those deep chested dogs, we'd find a lot like up in the um, front. Okay, so, um, so microchip skin. Again, I think it's, you know, fairly straightforward, but just essentially take the time, slow down, um, and, and scan the animal appropriately. Um, now I want to move on to point of care tests. And so these are going to be, um, you know, those kind of simple, uh, quick diagnostics that you can do right in the shelter. Uh, you know, you don't have to send it out to a lab. You can do it right there um, in your uh, clinic area, whatever area you use. Um, so essentially how these work, they rely on a flow, the flow of fluids across a membrane that's inside a cassette. Um, so typical examples would be like, you know, your heartworm test, a parvo test, your, your feline combo test that you're used to, probably used to using in the shelter. So, I think biggest thing with these is pay attention to the directions <laughs> and the inserts that are that are in there, um, and you know first of all just think about temperature. Some of them some of them do have to be refrigerated, others don't, um, and this this is important because um, particularly those you know if they don't have to be refrigerated but they so they are put in the refrigerator some condensation forms, and then that gets on that membrane that's going to affect how how well the the test runs. So you know. Uh, fluid's not going to flow across across that membrane as well as it should. Um, 
And then, so this is, you know, typical think of, so this is obviously the IDEX brand, a SNAP test. Um, comes with all these pieces. A little pipette that's sitting there. <laughs> How many of you use it? Hey, there's a few people that do. What do the rest of you do with it? Dump it, Dump it. yeah. So why do they put it in there? It's, it's garbage, yeah, they just want to add to our landfills and, 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 and create more trash. So this goes along the lines of um, following the directions that are, that are in there. You know, if you notice, this is from one test. It's using the pipette provided. And, you know, on this uh, other one, it's, uh, you know, draw a sample into the stem portion of the pipette provided. Reason being is that those pipettes are calibrated to deliver the proper volume per drop to the test, and that's how those tests are validated using the, um, the you know, those pipettes that are in there. So, you know, is it, is it going to work uh, if you're just drawing something up into a syringe and using it that way? Yeah, it might work, but if you have, if you have problems with it, um, you know, can you rely on, on the results of those tests? You know, maybe, maybe not. And I can guarantee you if you, so if you have problems with the tests and, you know, something doesn't seem to be working, um, the first thing you should do is call the company and check with them. Um, and the first thing they're going to ask you is how you're running the test and are you following directions. Um, and I can tell you I know this for a fact. My husband is a veterinarian with HESCA. And when they get calls about the heartworm test, is the first thing they ask. Um, and probably about at least 50% of the calls that they get, they, they readily admit they don't even read the directions and they just you know, did it how they wanted to. So, so you know everybody's doing it, but just, you know, if you, if you follow the directions, you're more likely to get um, the consistent results that you can rely on. Um, and also to make sure that, that you're using the appropriate sample. Um, you know, so this one right here, it specifically says, you know, you can use serum, you can use plasma or anticoagulated whole blood, but do not use a manually heparinized syringe. And... I know there's a lot of shelters. There's some teaching hospitals I know of too that do that. That is their protocol is to go heparinize a syringe. But what you should be doing is drawing up your blood sample, if, obviously if it's, if it's blood that you need, and then either, you know, again, if you want to use serum, want to use plasma, you can do that. Or use anticoagulant whole blood by um, putting that sample in a purple top tube. Um, and, you know, and the, and the benefit to that too is that say you do make a mistake running that test, or, or you have a test that just doesn't, it, you know, it's not running appropriately, and it happens, you know, you get those um, fluke tests that just for some reason don't work. Then if you've drawn up a sample, uh, you know, a decent sized sample and put it in that purple top tube, you now have more sample, and you can just go ahead and run another test, and you don't have to go draw more, you know, go back, draw more blood, and take more time and come back and do it. So, you know, follow, follow the directions that are there and, and, and do what the company is telling you to do. Um, so wanted to talk just a little bit about um, the basics of microscope use and care because the other, most of the other tests we're going to get into are, um, require a microscope to, uh, to look for, um, you know, look for parasites or, or look for uh, fecal parasites, that kind of thing. So, like I said, wanted to talk a little bit about microscopes because I think that is one thing that kind of gets, gets overlooked and sometimes microscopes don't get as well taken care of as they should. Um, and it's, you really don't have to do that much to, to take care of it, but I'm sure all of you have dealt with the really gross microscope that somebody didn't clean or hasn't cleaned maybe in weeks and it's sticky and, um, and when you think about some of the things that we're doing, you know, we're, we're looking at fecal samples sometimes and so I don't want to think about what might be on there. So, so that's why we're just going to go through this a little bit. Um, but so parts of the microscope we'll talk about and then um, talk just a little bit about sample prep for the different types of, of samples that are, yeah, samples you might be preparing. Um, and then again, some basic microscope care. So Parts of the microscope, so just as I'm referring to these, and you know, I think probably everybody's fairly 
familiar with this, but if you remember the so the, the top piece that you're looking into, those are your ocular lenses and, and the nose piece, again, you know, you can typically adjust. Um, if you didn't know that, you depends on the microscope, but most you'll be able to adjust how wide those eyepieces are. Um, and I say that because some people don't realize that. I've, I've literally been, you know, been with people trying to teach them and they're like, I just can't see. And, and I'm looking and like, you know, their eyes are maybe more wide set than mine are and they're trying to look through these you know, put their, make their eyes match up and they're like kind of doing this and going back and forth. Um, so you just adjust those, it'll make your life a lot easier. Um, and then you have your objective lenses. And so those are your um, different powers. So you typically have, you know, 4X, 10X, maybe 40, and then 100X, you know, that you can spin around. And then your stage, that's where you set the slide. Um, that's the piece that usually gets really dirty when people have, you know, sticky slides or something like that. Um, and then your, your condenser and diaphragm are that piece that sit below the stage. Um, and that'll come into play a little bit later when we talk about some of the different cytologies you look at because you can actually raise and lower that condenser. And what that does is it helps with contrast because it affects um, how much light um, is, <coughs> excuse me, is coming through. Um, and then obviously your, um, the base and um, the focusing handle on the side. Again, I think everyone's probably pretty familiar with that. Your, large knob kind of um, closest to the base. That's your, what's called your course adjustment. And then the little, the one on the, um, the smaller one just outside of that is your um, fine adjustment. Um, so sample prep. Um, so gonna vary a little bit depending on what we're looking at at the slide. But typically, you know, what we're looking at is either, um, you know, blood, urine, uh, feces, and then maybe some solid material. Um, so if blood, um, just want to make sure that that's dried and stained before you go and look at that under the, under the microscope. And typically, um, and you guys are, are probably familiar with this if you've looked at any blood smears, um, you know, you might be able to ID some cells that, you know, with a 10X or, you know, maybe 40X, but typically you have to go all the way up to 100X, an oil immersion lens, to be able to really evaluate those cells and look at the detail that's there. Um, urine, um, you know, that's one we're typically looking at. We're just urine right on the slide, um, so it's wet, and we're putting a cover slip over that. Um, uh, sometimes putting a stain in there um, while it's still wet. One thing to um, keep in mind, particularly when you're doing urine, if you're using, um, you know, using a stain to help you look at that urine, um, just watch how old your stain is. If you start getting a lot of like sediment in there, um, then you can get little contaminants and that can actually um, throw people off and they think they're maybe seeing crystals in the urine or they're seeing bacteria or something and really it's just sediment from the stain. So if you're at all worried about you know, your stain and it looks like maybe there's little floaties in there, just get rid of it and get something new. Um, feces, um, that we'll go into a little bit more detail later, um, but that we can either do a wet mount with a cover slip on it or we can do um, dried smear, um, typically, you know, 10x, maybe 40x for, for ID there. And then the solid materials, so these would be things like skin scrapes or, um, you know, waxy ear type um, debris, cytology that you're looking at. Um, and again, might be cover slipped or it might be um, a dried, dried and stained smear that you're looking at. Um, and then cytology, um, which I'm not really going to get into the specifics of, of that, but like fine needle aspirates or maybe fluid aspirates. Um, that's going to be similar to, to blood. So just some things to keep in mind when we're using the microscope is um, you always want to start with the lowest objective. So typically that's 4x, might be, maybe you don't have a 4x, so it'd be, probably be 10x. But start with your lowest objective and use that course adjustment. So that's, you know, kind of the bigger fatter knob, if you will, that's close to the base to, um, to bring the sample into focus. Be really careful because with this one, if you've ever watched it, it actually makes your stage go up and down. And, and this is why you want to start with your lowest um, objective because that's also your shortest objective. Um, because if you have one of the higher objectives, which is longer, um, and, I, and I know this from personal experience, if you use that course adjustment and you bring that stage up too high, uh, your, your slide gets smashed <laughs> into pieces. So um, if anybody else wants to admit to doing that, you're welcome to, but um, it happens. 
Um, so again, so just be careful with that course adjustment. But then once it's in focus, that's when you then can jump in with your, your fine adjustment and start adjusting as you're going through, you know, moving up through your objectives. And big thing to um, only use oil on your oil immersion objectives. Um, and again, if, you know, if you're not familiar with it, take a look at your microscope when you get back. And it, it says very clearly on the objective if it's oil immersion. If it's not, don't drag it through the oil because um, it can ruin that objective um, or at the very least makes it very difficult to, to use and, and look through and evaluate things. Um, and again, I'm sure everybody's been there when you've had somebody that's not paying attention and, you know, um, drags the 10x through, through the oil and, and gets it all dirty and you have to take it apart and clean it. Um, so speaking of cleaning it, um, basic care of a microscope, really not, not too terribly difficult, but after each use, really you should just wipe off the, um, the ocular and the objective lenses. And you can just use distilled water or uh, they do make you know, like a mic microscope lens cleaning solution that you can use. Um, and I, I put up a link there and it, it's in the notes, um, but there was, I, I just happened to find this really nice link um, from Duke that goes through how to clean an objective um, if you need kind of step-by-step -step, um, instructions. And it actually shows nice little pictures if it's something, you know, we wanted to grab and throw that up in, in your shelter to show people how to do it. Um, and then, like I mentioned, you know, wipe off that stage because it can get really sticky, you know, if you're using like a sugar solution for your fecals that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, if that gets on the stage, it just gets sticky and gross. Um, so that, all you really need is some warm kind of soapy water just to um, clean that off and then wipe it off. Um, and then daily, really, too, you should do kind of a full clean on it. So you got the eyepiece and then the condenser and the diaphragm. Again, you can just wipe those off. Um, sometimes even using just compressed air to blow any dust off, that helps a lot. Um, and then at the end of the day, it's one of those it's best to center it back, make sure it's centered on that lowest objective, whatever that is for you. That just helps, again, so that the next person that comes along and goes to use it, that it's already set up at the lowest objective. Obviously, turn, turn the power off so you're not, um, not wasting electricity and that you're saving the little light bulb that's under there. Um, and cover it. Um, if you don't have a microscope cover, go get one. Um, you could probably make one pretty easily, too, if you needed to. But they're you know, really inexpensive. You can just get them through. Uh, uh, veterinary supply distributor, um, but it, it helps a lot to make sure that it's covered every day um, to keep all the dust and everything out of it. And then ideally, um, it should be serviced professionally every year, you know, so they come in just like with any other kind of piece of equipment. Somebody that really knows what they're doing with that comes in, takes it apart, cleans it. Um, uh, look around, see if there's somebody that services microscopes in your area. You know, if you can't find anybody um, easily, maybe check if there are any like labs in your area. They'd probably know of somebody that does it or if there's like a high school that has, you know, have microscopes, that kind of thing. They, they might be able to direct you to somebody. And, you know, let them know you're a shelter. They may even donate the service. I know that's what we had the shelter um, that, I was, that I was at. Uh, we had somebody, he would just come in once a year and, and clean our microscope for us. And it was so, it was really nice. Um, so moving on to, to the diagnostics that we'll use the microscope for, um, skin scrapes. So obviously this is probably one that, that people are doing quite frequently. So supplies that we're going to need, um, obviously mineral oil, um, ideally a dull number 10 blade, or you can get, uh, order a little like stainless steel micro spatula. I know some of the um, dermatologists really like those. Um, but the, the dull ones are, it's actually better to have a dull blade. Um, to do the scraping, so you're less likely to cause inadvertent trauma to the skin. Um, and as an aside, when I was in, in vet school, we, had, we actually we had an awesome um, dermatologist at Iowa State, um, but he actually kept one, he even named it, it was Excalibur, was, was the name of, of the scalpel blade, but it was stored away in a little jar and he just cleaned it after every use. Um, I know that might be harder to do. I tried to do that in the shelter, and it always seemed to just <laughs> disappear every time I went to look for it. So um, obviously, you're going to need some slides, some cover slips, um, also some um, tape, um, and we'll get into that. But some so clear, like cellophane tape, not the frosted stuff. Um, and then some um, just like little mosquito uh, or thumb forceps, so not these rat tooth kind. You don't, you don't want those for, um, for the skin scrapes. Um, so we'll start with superficial scrape. 
Um, so remember, with this, our, our target parasites, um, you know, Chylitiella, maybe Sarcoptes, or Demodex, Gatui, and <coughs> excuse me, in the cats. Um, for sample sites for these, you want to go to active lesions. So, you know, maybe on the margin of the pinna or on the elbow, something like that, you know, wherever you see the lesions, but also sample from multiple locations. Um, so, for superficial scrape, um, you can put mineral oil um, either like on the blade itself or um, on the site that you're going to scrape. Or what I often would do, I would actually put a little bit on the slide and kind of dip my um, blade into that. I just I found that that worked best. But what you want to do is hold that blade at a right angle and scrape in the direction of fur growth. And remember, with if you're just doing a superficial scrape, you do not need to see blood. So you're just trying to, to scrape the surface. And then once you do that, kind of use the blade, or if you're using one of the little micro spatulas, kind of scoop up all your debris, put it on the side, excuse me, the slide. Um, and I would often, to, to get it off, I would just kind of flip the blade over and you know, kind of uh, run it along the edge of the slide to get all the material and then push it back into the middle. And then you're ready, just um, if you need a little more, more mineral oil, add some, drop a cover slip on it and take a look at that. Now with the deep scrape, um, you guys probably realize, you know, what we're typically looking for with the deep scrape is Demodex. Um, and again, just like with the superficial scrape, go for those active lesions in multiple locations. Um, so um, fairly uh, similar process, but we do want to start, um, before we do a deep scrape, we want to pinch the area that we're scraping. Does anybody know, remember why we're pinching? Bring up, right, exactly, yeah. So Demodex lives down in the hair follicles. So a lot of times you almost think of it as like you're milking <laughs> the follicles. So, so squeeze it a little bit and you're trying to push them up out of the follicles. So you might get a little better yield if you do that. So pinch, and you, obviously you don't have to pinch really hard. You don't want to hear the dog yelp or anything. But just do a little pinch before you um, scrape the area. And then um, after you pinch, you can either kind of pull the skin flat again or you can can keep it pinched, it's up to you. But then again, you're gonna kind of scrape in the same, the same way you would for superficial. But obviously you're going um, a little bit deeper. So you just wanna see capillary bleeding. Um, so, so with that, you know, this is a good picture of capillary bleeding. You know, you're just getting down to the dermis, you're seeing a little bit of capillary bleeding. You should not see like big drops of blood um, pulling on the surface of the skin. That's more than a deep <laughs> scrape. Um, and honestly, if you're starting to see that much blood, you're probably going to get so much blood on the slide that you're not going to be able to, to see a lot um, and find what you're looking for. So again, kind of scoop all that debris, put it on the slide, um, and take a look at it with a cover slip. Um, uh, you can also use the tape kind of to, to do a, an alternate type of um, deep scrape. And I never really did it this way. I wasn't taught, but I found it was an interesting um, description that was in um, this clinician's brief article and so essentially what you're doing is taking that tape um, and you put it on the area that you'd want to scrape um, obviously sticky side down and then while it's on there you're gonna kind of pinch and roll the skin and kind of keep moving it along and do that in a couple spots and then take your take your tape put it down you should have already put some mineral oil on the slide put it um, sticky side down on the slide and then you can just look at that under the scope without a cover slip since there's since there's tape there um, so this is one that can be good maybe for those on cooperative patients you know the um, wiggly pit bull that just doesn't want to sit still um, that you know you're worried about demodex but you're also of course it's you know probably like right spots right up here around his eyes and you're worried about taking a blade and and getting near his eyes so tape might work better um, and then the other thing you can do and actually I, I always recommend doing it, and it's probably how I was taught, but it's to do a trichogram at the same time that you're doing a scrape. Um, and this was uh, the procedure we had in place. Um, the, the shelter I was at was that if you did a scrape, you did a trichogram. Um, and so essentially what that is, is you're just plucking a few hairs. So you take, again, those um, non-rat tooth forceps, grab a few hairs from your lesion, um, and just pull those out put them on mineral oil on a slide. Um, so reason that this is good um, for 
For parasites, remember, if you, we just talked about how demodex like to live in the follicles. So sometimes this is how you can diagnose demodex because when you pull these, these hairs out, you'll actually find the demodex right, right down near um, the base of, of the fur. Um, and so I mentioned earlier about the condenser. When you're doing um, any kind of uh, skin scrape microscopy, take that condenser. So again, that's that, that circular piece that sits right below the stage. You want to put that in the lowest position so it's not right up next to the slide. Um, reason being, it increases con contrast, which really helps with looking at um, a lot of these parasites. Um, and this is you know, one, again, you guys probably, if you've looked at Demodex under a slide, you know it doesn't, doesn't take much. You know, a lot of times you can find them at 4x, maybe go up to 10x and you can find them. Do remember that you know, if you put oil on the slide, it's probably going to kind of move along like uh, a, a river a little bit. Um, so make sure you're scanning the entire slide as that oil's kind of moving around. Because um, you guys know sometimes you know, we're... Um, it's great when you find, find them having a little party like this. And um, it, they're, you know, they're, once you know what you're looking for, obviously they're very easy to see. But sometimes you're only finding you know, one or two um, in, in your scrape. Uh, so ear cytology, um, another really common diagnostic that um, you know, at, least, at least in any of the shelters I've been in, um, you know, I feel like we're looking at, looking at ears all the time. So with ear cytology, um, and again, this is the way I was taught, um, but I always would sample both ears, at least for the initial cytology. A um, couple of reasons. Um, you know, if there's, even if it looks like only one ear has pathology, there's, there's potentially something going on in that other ear. And if you're already there taking a sample, you know, you might as well just grab a sample from the other side as well. Um, and you can even just um, stick to using one slide. Um, so I had a system that we would, um, you know, while you're holding, we used, used uh, slides with like the frosted end. So hold the frosted end, and while I'm looking at it, I would roll the left ear on the left and the right ear on the right. So I didn't even have to label, you know, which was which. We just always knew that that's, that was the order. Um, but, you know, essentially take your um, uh, cotton swab, you know, go in there gently, get a sample and then just roll it out on the slide. Um, heat fix it, that helps because of all the waxy material that's in um, that, that sample typically. And then go ahead and stain. Um, you know, Diff Quick works just fine. You can use Gram Stain if you want, um, but I know most shelters typically just have uh, Diff Quick. And then you're gonna go ahead and um, obviously stain it, let it dry, um, and then go ahead and look at that under the microscope. Um, and one thing I didn't put on there, just be careful. Obviously, if you have the time, it's best to just kind of let them air dry. But I know everyone, again, usually kind of in a hurry needs to get things done. Now, see a lot of people use kind of the blotting paper to get, um, you know, to dry slides. You got to be really careful when you do that because if, you know, so if anyone's not familiar with it, it's essentially like a thin little book of, um, looks like a small little notepad. Um, but it's papers that are designed to be absorbent and you can, put your slide in between sheets and you kind of press down on it gently, it absorbs any liquid. Well, what can happen if you don't have much material on that slide um, or you press too hard, you can actually pick up a lot of your sample with that. So you may lose um, any diagnostic capability you had by picking up um, what was on the slide. So just be really careful. Um, one thing that actually works really well is a little hair dryer. Um, so get, you know, let it as much as possible. You know, you've rinsed it off kind of shake off the excess liquid and then take a hair dryer quickly to it and that, um, that really helps to dry things quickly. Ear cytology, I think we're all familiar with these guys, right? You guys have all seen them. Usually it's, they're having a little party when you, um, you know, pull um, samples out and look at them on the slide. Um, anybody know what those got yeast? Awesome, yeah, so malassezia, so um, you know, if, if you're not familiar with it, you're looking for, some people call it the little, um, the, some people call them uh, peanuts, you know, I think they look like peanuts, the, the dark purple um, peanuts up there. Um, you may find bacterial infections as well. Um, sometimes you even find bacteria and white blood cells, so there's neutrophils on there. Um, typically, if you find those, that's 
not a great indication. Usually, you know, if, if, you know, if I saw that right away, I'd be thinking pseudomonas. And I'm guessing if you get a cytology like that, those ears probably really smell too. They're the really like moist, goopy, gooey, gross things um, that you definitely want to do cytology on because you want to know what you're dealing with. Um, but you, you may also find that. So anybody know what the arrow's pointing to? So they're not bacteria. Uh, so little um, like pigment, it's just some melanin um, pigment that's in there. Um, but it does fool people. Sometimes you know they see that and they're like, oh my gosh, it's bacteria. But if you can tell, they're kind of all within. That's a keratinocyte, um, so just a skin cell that's in there. So that's another clue. They're all kind of within that cell. Um, but again, we'll go over some of that tomorrow if you guys are going to the skills lab. Um, so. Um, Quickly, with ear cytology, you want to quantitate your findings. And this is a, a kind of a nice scoring system from, from zero to four. So zero being, you know, we're not finding anything. There's no bacteria. There's no yeast. You know, one, the occasional, all the way up to four. That's, you know, you just look at the slide and, and there they are. Everything's, uh, you know, it's just covered with uh, bacteria and or yeast, maybe some inflammatory cells. Um, and, you know, I've seen some slightly varying numbers, but essentially, you know, if you're finding more than, than 10 yeast or 25 bacteria per field, that's abnormal. Um, and again, most of the time, probably in the shelter setting, you're, you're going to find something, you know, we're looking at abnormal ears to begin with. We're not typically doing just routine ear cytology on these guys. Um, but just make sure you quantify it because that helps with going forward because obviously if you start treating these guys, you're probably going to come back later and, you know, check and see how they're doing. So you want to be able to quantitate, okay, it was a four plus three weeks ago, but now we're down to a two plus, so obviously you're making progress. Um, so we'll move on to fecal pathogens. Um, so with um, looking at fecal pathogens, um, essentially there's, there's three different techniques that we can use. So basic fecal flotations, uh, a direct smear or maybe a wet mount, some people might call it, and then a, excuse me, a stained smear. So the fecal flotation, as you guys probably know, you know we're, we're typically looking for parasite eggs. So we're looking for that diagnostic stage um, in the feces. Uh, direct smear or that wet mount, um, typically um, that's when we think there might be something that's modal. So Giardia or Trichomonas. Um, and then a stained smear, a lot of times we're looking maybe for specific bacteria or to try and find out if there's a bacterial overgrowth um, or maybe um, you could also find um, some white blood cells as well. Hopefully not, but you might. Um, so identifying fecal pathogens. So a um, couple pitfalls or I guess, you know, things to, to think about to, um, to avoid these so that you can help um, improve the uh, diagnostic capabilities of your um, samples. Um, or of, of the diagnostic excel itself. Um, just again, make sure your microscope's clean so that you know, when you're looking through there, you can actually um, visualize things well. Um, also make sure, again, that your, um, that your slides are clean. Because I've actually seen that happen with like, dirty slides. They just get debris on them, um, that that can fool people. Or again, with, with stains, um, if you get a lot of debris in the stain that you're using, that can also create artifact and throw people off. Um, and this is one, too, where you really need to make sure the person that's reading the fecals knows what they're looking for. Um, and this, again, you know, it takes, it takes a little bit of time to learn, but make sure that the individuals that are reading your fecals, again, they know what they're looking for. Um, so get some good, you know, parasitology books or um, perhaps um, a chart. So, you know, the, these are a couple books. Those are both books that um, I kept in the shelters. Or you might be able to find charts like this, which are really nice to be able to post near your microscope, um, both for training purposes and then just for reference purposes. So, you know, when you're, you know, even if you know what you're doing, when you sit there and you look at the slide and you're like, eh, I'm trying to figure, you know, which, which egg is that? And you kind of do the whole, let's match the picture and see which one looks like what I'm looking at on the slide. Um, but it's always, you know, it's great reference to have there, to have um, posted. So, Fecal flotations are probably the most common. I think that's what most people are familiar with. Um, and so essentially this relies on the, uh, the difference between the specific gravity of the solution you're using and then the parasite um, that, that you're trying to detect. So essentially if 
the specific gravity of the solution is greater than that of the egg, the egg is going to float. Um, so some of the common solutions, um, that might, you might use a salt solution. So for the two most common, or you know, zinc sulfate, it's probably the more common of the two, but sodium nitrate's another one. Um, and then the Sheather sugar solution is very common. A lot of people use that. Um, and that one has a bit of a higher specific gravity. Um, and so the sugar solution is actually probably better, would be probably the better choice all around, if you will, um, looking for the, um, to get most of the common parasites that we see. Now, if you are seeing a lot, think you're seeing a lot of, of Giardia, the uh, zinc sulfate can be a little bit better for um, getting better yield with the, um, for your flotation solution. Um, so when doing those fecal floats too, a couple of, you know, kind of tips for success, make sure you have at least two grams of feces. So you need, you know, you need a, a decent little sample. So let your staff know that because you know a lot of times in shelters you're relying on maybe animal care staff or even volunteers. If they see diarrhea or something, let them know, you know, you need, you know, you can't just go dip a swab in it and bring it back and that's enough. Um, I'm sure everyone's been in that situation. Um, and also too, if you use um, any of those, um, what's the brand name, fecalizer or, you know, that little collection system that you can, you know, collect the sample and you just put the solution in it. Um, if you use those, make sure you instruct your staff where the feces goes. Um, okay, I see a lot of heads nodding. Yeah, like we've got, you guys all know you're supposed to, you know, take out the centerpiece, stick that in the feces and bring it back. Yeah, we've had them come back, you know, and the feces is like shoved down in the middle and yeah, it's, it's everywhere. So, um, you know, maybe put up a little picture diagram or something um, for that staff can refer to so that you don't have the frustration of having to go get another sample or, you know, dig out another fecalizer to use. Um, and then, you know, occasionally, ideally, if you can, you know, routinely, um, occasionally check that specific gravity of flotation solutions, that helps just to make sure they're not becoming too saturated. Um, and then also use a timer for, um, to make sure you have sufficient wait times for doing your flotations. Because you guys, um, again, if you've done a lot of fecals, realize that you need to, um, and we'll talk about the two active kind of centrifugation versus passive, but after you, um, spin it down or, or mix it up. You have to let it set so that those eggs can rise. Um, so set a, I use a timer for two reasons. First of all, so that you're waiting long enough, um, but probably more importantly, to remind someone to come back and look at it because I know that's what always happened in our shelter was that people knew, okay, I've got about 10 minutes now. I'm going to go do something else because I've got 10 minutes to get something else done. And then all of a sudden it's 20 minutes later and it's, oh, you know, crap, I forgot to go and look at that. Yeah. We run into the problem at our shelter of Right, right. So her question was essentially, you know, they um, batch them all up so they can do them all at once. And um, they, they have so many that, yes, they set the timer, they come back, but by the time they get to the 20th sample, it may have been sitting there. For, like nothing against her, that's just, it's not ideal. Yeah, not ideal. And, it, you know, the, the biggest issue with that and it, um, is that the solution, and you've probably noticed as you get to those last ones, it starts to dry and crystallize around the edge. And then so that's going to affect potentially, you know, what you're seeing and may throw off, um, you know, maybe you're, you're, you're calling it negative or maybe it's throwing in a lot of artifacts that are making it more difficult to read. I don't know, you know, that may have been some of the, you know, issues that you've run into. So it's, you know, if there's any way, if you could even, if you're finding that there's that many and you're starting to wait that long, I wonder if you could find a way to even split it into two times a day so there's not so many. Oh, you're talking about the, the sample yeah. itself. Right, I see what you're saying. So they're just leaving them sitting out all day long. Right, and it smells. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, so her question also too was, the other concern with that is if they're just leaving those fecal samples sitting out, you know, shouldn't they be refrigerated if you're not going to look at them right away? Yes, and that, that would be another concern. So 
um, that might be something to think about is just how can you work out either can you have, have them drop off samples in the refrigerator till, and then somebody sets them up when they're ready to go and maybe if it is that many samples um, you know two things smaller batches and then maybe I'd also look to do we need to be running that many you know and two things there and, and this is obviously going to do another discussion but if there's that many concerns maybe we need to look at some other you know healthcare issues um, or are we getting people that are overreacting and bringing us samples for every you know slight little loose bit of stool that they find yes and we're also a shelter who takes a large number of transport so we'll get a transport in and there's x amount of dogs and then everyone's getting a, everyone's getting fecal so oh okay so yeah her, her comment was that everybody's getting a fecal so um, and we can chat about that a little bit more um, when we're done. I just don't, I want to <laughs> um, move along. But those would be a couple things. I would at least look at maybe batching, you know, can you do it in smaller batches? Yeah. Um, and then, so comparing those um, fecal flotation math methods, so you have both passive and centrifugation. So um, how many people are doing fecals by centrifuge? Anybody? Okay, awesome. And then so I'm assuming the rest are doing passive. So that would be using like that fecalizer type system where you just put the feces in, mix it up, and then just let it sit there with the solution. Um, so there's obviously advantages and disadvantages to, to both. Um, if you use the centrifuge, um, you do tend to get better yield. Um, it's, it's not that those samples have more parasites, but you're just more likely to get, um, to recover the eggs and get a true positive diagnosis, so fewer false negatives. Um, obviously, you do need a centrifuge for that. Um, but, uh, you, know, if it's, you know, if you can, obviously it's a one-time investment. If you can't, you can't. Just realize that you may be missing um, some, uh, some positives if you're going that route. Um, and then direct smear, and sorry, we're, we're getting low on time. Um, but so the direct smear, like I said, that's, you're going to put a little bit of um, feces on the slide. And I'll start playing this. Uh, if you guys want to um, Google this, you can. If you just um, Google Tritrichomonas video or Giardia video, you can see this slide is great because it has both um, pathogens on the slide and you can look at the different motility. So that would be if you're worried about one of those um, uh, parasites in particular, you could do a wet mount and take a look under the scope, see if you see any of those organisms. Um, stained smear. Um, that's uh, essentially like you would do kind of with, the, with an ear swab, but obviously you're getting um, a fecal sample, rolling it out on the slide and staining it. Um, and so you're typically looking for um, uh, campy, uh, Campylobacter, which is that nice little kind of seagull-shaped organism, or maybe Clostridia, um, and this is kind of a close-up of it over on the, your, your far right. So some people say the Clostridia, so they might call it like a clothespin or excuse me, a safety pin, because um, you can see the spore at the top there kind of creates that, that lighter color um, in, the, in the rod there. Um, sometimes, too, you can get an idea if there's like a bacterial overgrowth when you're doing a stain smear. But as you guys can see, um, you definitely need somebody that knows what they're looking for. Um, and again, it doesn't, doesn't take too long to, to figure out um, what what you're looking for, but you definitely want somebody that's trained. Um, and I'm sorry, we're, since we're getting low on time, I'll probably go through this a little quickly, but we're definitely doing um, the woods lamp, right? Lena, sorry, see <laughs> Lena back there, just want to make sure. So during the diagnostics piece tomorrow, um, going through the, wood lamp, the woods lamp and how to, how to take a sample for um, if you're concerned about ringworm. Um, but essentially woods lamp, as you guys probably know, it's a screening tool to look for um, ringworm, um, Microsporum canis is the only dermatophyte, um, well, the only one we care about in, in uh, veterinary medicine, um, that fluoresces. Um, but if you're going to use it, a um, couple of things to think about. You want to make sure, obviously, you're in a dark room. 
Um, and when you, you know, give the lamp a little bit of time to warm up when you plug it in and let your eyes adjust to the dark. That's probably the most important thing. You know, don't just run in there, turn the light on and start looking. Give your, um, give your eyes a chance to adjust um, and have somebody to help you. It's really hard to go in, particularly because it's usually kittens and they're squirming around and, you know, maybe scratching because they want to get away. For you to try to hold the kitten and then take, use your other hand and use the lamp and look at them. So bring in a pair of, uh, you know, a second pair of hands if you can. So you have one person that can hold the, the cat um, and then one person that can, that can use the lamp. Biggest thing is to make sure that you pick the right style of lamp. Um, you need one that has the right wavelength and that's the 365 nanometers. Um, so you want a plug-in style. I know you'll see these a lot, um, but um, don't use those. You want to get one that's like this, that you can um, plug in. And there's a couple different places you can get them from. I know I ordered ones through Jorgensen Labs, um, and you can get them through distributors like MWI. Um, but the biggest thing is make sure, check that wavelength so that you're able to find the to get the fluorescence. Um, if, you, if you haven't um, done this before, again, it's something that once you know what you're looking for, it's fairly easy, but you do need um, somebody to, to help, um, you know, kind of train you if you're not familiar with it. But essentially it's, uh, this picture probably doesn't do it justice, but it's an, like an apple, apple green type of fluorescence. Um, and sometimes, um, what you might see is just like you'll see the whole shaft glows or sometimes if the hairs are missing but the little the follicles themselves will glow so you might see these little pinpoint areas um, and it's typically you'll look like around around the face and then the paws are uh, in the ears are all kind of they're kind of the big three areas where we really like to look for lesions um, but there are a couple other things that can fool people again if they're not familiar with it Doxycycline glows beautifully under a woods lamp. Um, so if you've been treating somebody for URI with doxy, um, you'll be able to tell because, um, it, like I said, it glows be yeah, beautifully. Um, teramycin can do it too. And sometimes even just a lot of dust and lint um, that, can, that can glow as well. Um, and I always tell people, you know, if you're not sure, what I would usually try and do, um, obviously you're wearing gloves while you're doing this because it's a ringworm suspect, but just try and you know, kind of brush something off the fur, you know, kind of scratch it away and see if it disappears. If it does, um, obviously um, your ringworm's not going to just disappear. Fungal cultures, um, again, this is, this is in the lecture, but the best way to do it is to use a, the toothbrush method. Um, and this actually tends to work really well. Um, again, it's typically cats that were, that were culturing, but um, they almost, they like it. I think it's like they're being groomed. So they seem to, they almost seem to enjoy it. So you just, you know, you're using a toothbrush, do the lesions last. Um, and then you inoculate your media. Um, so best thing to do if you can, take, um, take the plate and almost like turn it upside down and then take your brush and gently um, poke it in to, um, to the auger, to the media and cover the plate. And then you want to um, incubate that. Um, and I'm not going to get into the specifics of, um, looking at uh, doing, doing the culture too much, other than to say um, the Petri style dish is definitely preferred over um, this flask style. And reason being, it's not that things don't grow on those flasks, but they're really hard to inoculate. And then when you want to get a sample out to try and ID what pathogen you have, it's really hard to, to get a piece of tape in there. Much easier to take the Petri dish, take the top off, and, and get your sample. Um, Again, identifying um, the fungi, biggest thing, you look for the red color change and white colonies, and those are your suspects that you're going to start with, and um, you can get a sample, and then you get, hopefully you can ID it. So, um, so conclusions, just, um, you know, pick, pick the best diagnostic pr procedure for you. Just think about what you're using, and make sure you understand the procedure um, and follow directions. But if you have any questions, I'm happy to, happy to stick around.